So today is day three of my why don't I drive around Lake Michigan in the winter trip. And yesterday's adventure is over and today is a new day. I'm in Marquette, Michigan at a very pretty lighthouse. I'm going to try to fly my drone and show you this lighthouse from the air. The area around Marquette, Michigan began to get settled when iron ore was discovered in 1844. By 1850, the town had grown enough that its harbor warranted a lighthouse, one of only a few on Lake Superior, and one was built in 1853. The Sioux Locks would open two years later, bringing much more ship traffic. The stone tower and dwelling didn't stand up to the extreme weather of the Upper Peninsula and by 1865 already needed extensive repairs. Congress provided $13,000 for the renovations, but a completely new lighthouse was built instead. The structure we see today is that building, although it's gone through many changes. They must have had a large crew working there in 1887 because someone was in charge of recording how long the fog whistle blew. That year would be a record year because it blew 697 hours, or 8% of the time. On the other hand, in 1904, it sounded only 189 hours, or just 2% of the time. The noise annoyed residents so much that a parabolic wooden sound deflector covered with iron and filled with sawdust was placed around the whistle in 1897. In 1911, the whistle was electrified and the main building was painted the now familiar red. The light was electrified in 1921. Lighthouse tours are now offered by the Maritime Museum. Several years ago I went looking for winter in the UP because our Chicago winter was so mild and I definitely found it. While I was driving north on I-75 I hit a really bad snowstorm after dark that lasted from Gaylord over the Mackinac Bridge to St. Ignace. On that trip, the problem was that everything was closed, like the smaller roads, entrances, even road shoulders, but I still managed to get some good photography done. Last year, I made the same trip around Lake Michigan at the beginning of January. Bond Falls was sort of accessible. Marquette was freezing and very icy. Parts of Taquamanon Falls were open, but the road to Chris Point Lighthouse was open and drivable all the way to the lighthouse. The first time I went to Chris Point was about 15 years ago. Back then, I don't think the road was as well marked as it is today. It's about 20 miles from the 123, which is also Falls Road, the road you take to Taquamina Falls, and the intersection of 500. Then you take the 500 for about 15 miles to the 412, which takes you to Chris Point. There's no phone service after you get off 123. Expect the drive to take an hour each way.
After my adventure from the day before, I was very leery of trying to go to Chris Point, but I really wanted to see it with the drone, especially in winter. It turned out that 500 was a breeze. I'd read that the road wasn't maintained in the winter, but it was very easy driving. In fact, it was easier than in the summer because there were no cars and there was no dust. 412 was much sketchier though. After I missed the turnoff, you can see that I had to climb up onto the road surface. Just like at Bond Falls, the road was on about two or three feet of snow, but the driving was good. Four twelve really was not maintained. There weren't any other tire tracks, and compared to the Bond Falls road, this was much sketchier. And in case you were wondering, is this guy an idiot? The thought had crossed my mind many times too, but the desire to get the photo was stronger. Anyway, the approximately eight mile drive was beautiful, curvy, up and down, but uneventful. Unfortunately, a tree had fallen across the road about a mile or two from the lighthouse, and I couldn't go any further. Although I did walk out to the tree to see if I could drive under it. I couldn't. LOL. Well, this is as far as I'm going to go. I'm about two miles away from the lighthouse, but the road is closed. And I'm not going to try to make it under the tree there. The road's just not maintained. Snowmobiles would get through, but I'm not going to risk it, of course. And I don't feel like walking two miles. But what I think I will do is send my drone up, and we'll just see if uh, we can see anything interesting. So I flew the drone from where I was. I was close enough that I wondered if I could see the lighthouse from above. The footage is very pretty, but you can't see the lighthouse. I'll post some pictures from the year before, though. Crisp's Point Life Saving Station was originally known as Station Number 10, but it was renamed for Christopher Crisp, its second keeper, who served there from 1878 to 1890. In 1896, the Lighthouse Board requested $18,000 for a light and fog signal at Crisp's Point. Several wrecks had occurred there. The board repeated its request each year until Congress appropriated $18,000 for the station in 1902. The remote station was completed in 1904. It isn't exactly easy getting to Chris Point today, but it was a lot harder to get there in the early part of the 20th century. In April of 1933, a newspaper article described one of the keepers as having to travel the 20 miles from Whitefish Point to Chris Point using snowshoes. Chris Point was automated in 1941, but by 1988 the 84-year-old tower was unused and dilapidated. Efforts were made at great expense to preserve it, and it now has a permit from the Coast Guard to be used as a private aid to navigation. A visitor center was completed in 2009. If you feel adventurous, take a ride out to Crisp Point this summer. Although it is a nice place for sunsets, getting out of the maze of forest roads in the dark is difficult. After successfully turning myself around, I headed back to the 123, skipped to Quamanon Falls, and went to Whitefish Bay.
Well, I made it out to Whitefish Point, which is uh, quite a distance from um, Crisp Point uh, in miles uh, on roads, but it's not very far um, if you could fly there. And here it is. It's the oldest lighthouse on Lake Superior. So I'll send my drone up and show you what it looks like. Congress appropriated $5,000 for a light at Whitefish Point, but it ended up costing almost double. The oldest station on Lake Superior, it was first lit in 1849, but just 10 years later the Lighthouse Board requested funds for a new lighthouse. The new 78-foot tall Iron Pile Lighthouse was completed in the spring of 1861, along with similar ones built at Manitou Island on Lake Superior and Detour Point on Lake Huron. The current brick building was built in 1936. A museum devoted to shipwrecks on the Great Lakes has been open since 1983. Today Whitefish Point may best be known as the closest point in the U.S. to the wreck site of the Edmund Fitzgerald, an iron ore freighter lost on November 10, 1975. Its ship's bell was recovered on July 4, 1995 and is on display at the museum. Join me next time when I fly my drone on one of its short life's windiest days ever at both sides of the Mackinac Bridge.